Hello guys, Winston here. It's been quite a while since my last CNC project, and that's because I was on a rotational detail for work which took me to Florida for two months. I didn't have a lot of time at home, and by extension with my Shapeoko. It is also, however, the reason I was able to make several trips to the Kennedy Space Center, so I think it's a net win. If you didn't bother to see my last video, it was a montage showing off some of the things I got to see while exploring KSC as part of NASA Social a program that gives press credentials to social media users who want to share the experience with others. I got to see a lot of really cool things like the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle in addition to the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket. I'll probably make a video explaining what was going on in that montage in February, so if you're science inclined you may want to keep an eye out for that. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. I have a lot of projects planned for this year that I'm really excited about, so I figured I'd do a pre-spring cleaning and tune-up on my Shapeoko. It's been a while since I've done any sort of maintenance activity on my CNC, and because I spent a couple days during my rotation shadowing an engineer in a machine shop, I thought this would be a good time to start putting a little more thought into my experimentations. While learning about all the tolerances that industrial CNC machines are held to, I gained an appreciation for the dedication to precision that machinists have. And while a belt-driven Shapeoko will never realistically be held to two thousandths of an inch, it's still good to be knowledgeable of where in your workflow errors can be introduced. The first thing I did with my Shapeoko was to clean it. All of the dust that sticks to the lubricated bearings or gets compressed into the grooves of your V-wheels should be cleaned out. Next, I checked the tension on my belts. You definitely don't want there to be any slack, but you also don't want to over-tension them, otherwise you'll cause premature wear on the neoprene belts. The next thing I did was to re-level my table. I shimmed the MDF wasteboard halves with paper to ensure a smooth seam where they met. Some of you might cry foul thinking that I'm actually introducing error into the system because the wasteboard halves might now be sloped like a tent, and you're not wrong. But the alternative is to use a face mill to carve the wasteboard to quote-unquote machine level, which is only possible for a small subset of the wasteboard. It won't help much if you start with a piece of stock that overhangs your limited leveled area. In my opinion, as long as your four reachable corners and center are leveled within a couple thousandths, that's plenty good enough. The natural expansion and contraction of wood on a humid day introduces far more error than that. To level my Shapeoko against the wasteboard, I raised and lowered the Y-axis rails at each of the four corners until a fixed end mill just barely scraped the rim of a coin. You could also roll an end mill into your spindle if you want a more precise reference. I also took a couple minutes to resquare my Z-axis maker slide to ensure perfectly vertical travel of the carriage plate. The last thing I wanted to do was realign the Z-axis drive system. I had a hunch that by getting my threaded rod perfectly parallel to the Z-axis maker slide, I could get it to run more smoothly. The Delrin lead nut is a fixed distance from the maker slide, and by using my camera to resolve millimetric differences in the alignment of the threaded rod, I could get the rod parallel to the maker slide. Unfortunately, when I did this I realized why almost every troubleshooting question people have asked me about the Shapeoko seemed to relate to the Z-axis. The force required to turn the Z-axis with the threaded rod perfectly aligned with the maker slide increased dramatically from my sloppy baseline. By the way, now is probably a good time to recommend getting one of those knobs from Inventables for your Z stepper motor. Yes, with shipping it might be a little pricey, but it's difficult to find a knob with a 5mm bore elsewhere, much less one with a crank handle. The closest common sizes are 1 quarter inch and 6mm. Regardless, it makes adjusting your height so much easier than trying to manually turn the shaft coupler with your fingertips. It should really come standard with the machine in my opinion. Now it's a well documented fact that threaded rod systems are relatively imprecise. I experienced this myself when I tried to build a camera slider with a screw style drive. The specs and manufacturing tolerances for standard threaded rod are pretty sloppy from an engineering standpoint. The rod itself may not be straight, general purpose nuts may not thread onto the rod perpendicularly, and the thread profile itself isn't designed for power transmission. I guess this is what makes an Acme thread upgrade so appealing, although it's by no means necessary in most cases. Anyhow, I heard from one viewer that loosening the Delrin lead nut attached to the Z carriage plate allowed the drive shaft to spin more freely. I tried this myself and verified that it permits enough lateral slop in the machine that the alignment issues with the threaded rod are negated. However, it also introduces vertical inaccuracies since the mounting hole for the lead nut are a round, loose fit. If the holes had been horizontally slotted, maybe this would be a more viable option. Instead, I found that the best way to fix the Z-axis is the least scientific. Basically, you loosen one of the screws attaching the Z-stepper assembly to the maker slide, then pivot the mounting plate until you find the orientation that permits the smoothest possible motion of the threaded rod. You may need to slightly loosen the other screw to do this. Once you're convinced you've improved the situation with the Z-axis, tighten down the first screw and loosen the opposite one. The goal is to walk the stepper motor into the most neutral position possible relative to the Delrin lead nut one where the runout of the threaded rod causes the least amount of friction. Test the rotational resistance of the Z-axis at various heights along the maker slide as well. I managed to dial in my Z-axis to the point where there was almost no resistance when I rotated the stepper knob by hand. 
Previously, you could see the entire gantry deflect slightly from the force I was trying to apply to turn the crank handle. I tested the machine at both its upper and lower extremes, and there was almost no friction between the threaded rod and the delrin throughout its travel. Now I don't know what percentage of Z-axis complaints are addressed by this technique, but if you're having any mechanical difficulties getting your machine to cut smoothly, please give this a shot and let me know if it helps. It's something you should at least try before upping your stepper motor current or calling up Inventable's customer service. Software and electrical problems will of course need to be ironed out separately, and the folks on the forums are more knowledgeable about that than I am. And that's all I have for today. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll hopefully be keeping to at least a monthly upload schedule with bigger and better projects in the future. 